Hi, I'm Joseph. I'm the managing editor of Salon. And joining me today is Ken Forkish. He's a James Beard award-winning author and the owner of Ken's Artisan Bakery in Portland. So I was just on your website and I read that um, the bakery as well as the pizzerias have closed down during the pandemic. So I was just wondering how your businesses were doing. We were doing great up until then. Yeah, it was a hard stop. Was it a hard decision to close? Well, I mean, you know, every day we were, like everyone, you know, consuming the media. There seemed to be the information was becoming more complete day by day by day, uh, going back a few weeks now. Um, and was it hard uh, intellectually? No, the, the right thing to do was very evident, was very clear. We did a full stop at both my pizzerias, um, Checkerboard Pizza and Ken's Artisan Pizza. I mean, you know, both my staff and our guests, it's a sit down restaurant. You know, there's no way that spacing would work or be comfortable for anyone. At Ken's Artisan Bakery, we operated for a week with a restricted menu to go only. Um, and my entire team was uncomfortable and I completely was behind them. So we shut that uh, two weeks and a day ago. Uh, so yeah, I've been, uh, it's been hard stop, uh, all three of my places. Yeah, and the restaurant industry as a whole has been hit particularly hard by this. Um, are you yeah. hopeful that people will bounce back and do you think there'll be changes in the long term to the industry after this? Oh, almost certainly. Um, I, you know, on a personal level, I'm just hopeful that my staff returns when we get the green light. And you know, the question is, you know, when will that be? Uh, and are they, you know, at, at that point in time, how is the public going to react? So when we come back to work, I know everybody's really itching to go out to eat. We're all tired of cooking at home, even me. Uh, but at the same time, it's going to be really weird to go out to a restaurant sitting next to someone else. And I don't know how this is going to play out. You got a crystal ball? I sure don't. I don't. Um, and I'm trying to stay away from <laughs> any sort of predictions, right? Because I feel like it changes yeah. day by day, minute by minute. Yeah. Um, but hopefully we'll get to the other side sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, the other side is going to look different from the way things were a couple months ago. Yeah. And you know, hopefully uh, we'll all be able to survive. I hope so, too. Um, but before we get into the food and cooking at home and all of that stuff, I just wanted to ask you about your story, um, which I find so inspiring. Um, and I think a lot of our readers will too, but you used to have a corporate job and you left yeah. that, um, moved out to the West Coast, started your own bakery. Um, can you tell us about that? I had a 19 year career in tech. Um, I worked in the Bay Area for many years, um, also back in the East Coast. And it was evident to me pretty early on in my career that I wanted my own gig. Um, uh, I didn't want to keep, you know, working for the corporate thing. And just searched for, you know, you try to keep your mind open for what's, what's that going to be. I didn't have like a natural passion when I was in my 20s that I wanted to go pro with. Um, and then in, I told this story in my first book uh, in, in the mid 90s. Uh, I started going to France a lot. I had a girlfriend who lived in Paris. She was French uh, and started visiting bakeries there and boulangeries. And I really wanted, it was just so, I don't know, it just hit me at a very basic level of, um, it's hard to describe. I just wanted to stare in the windows and watch for hours on end. Anyway, it touched me deeply and I felt like that was what I wanted to do. And so at the end of the day, um, uh, I quit my last career, took a couple years off. Um, I didn't get wealthy. I just had barely enough money to um, educate myself. So I went to a lot of different culinary schools, just a week here, two weeks there. Uh, and essentially, instead of deciding I wanted to hire a team to do the baking, I wanted it to be mine. Uh, so I basically trained to, be, trained to be a baker and then just went for it. And so is that a message that you would share with any inspiring chef or someone in general who's thinking about a career change? One of the reasons I wrote my book with a long personal story in the beginning, now I kind of have a few regrets about that. Um, but it was also the style of that era of cookbook writing, um, you know, nine years ago, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people were like thinking about doing the same sort of thing. And it's not easy. And it's not a guarantee. And you could lose you know, a life's worth of savings in the process, which I almost did. Um, so I wanted to tell my story, but tell about the difficulties in it. 
uh, just to open people's eyes to the fact that, oh, I want to be a baker. That sounds really awesome, but it's really freaking hard, you know? Right. <laughs> so I tried to remove some of the, the veneer. So now that we've all found ourselves suddenly at home, um, like you said, we're all cooking at home, but I think that's taken us back to the basics, right? And one of those things is um, bread making. And I was just wondering if you've had people reaching out to you um, about this time and Absolutely, yeah. are, are you on call for advice? Um, what, what have you seen um, from people making bread at home? Um, I've seen an increase in sales in my books. That's been great. <laughs> that's, that's been great. Uh, I've had a lot of media requests actually over the last week of people that are, that a lot of people are at home baking right now. And it's, it's a great antidote to being in front of your screen all day long um, because you're doing something tangible and you're able to transform it yourself. So to go from a bag of flour and a bucket of water to a beautiful loaf of bread coming out of your oven, it's really cool when you know that you did that yourself. And that's what um, my book, Flour, Water, Salt, Yeast, was supposed to do, and I feel like it's doing a pretty good job of that. I feel like it's really calming too, right? Um, when I have to walk into my kitchen and focus, no matter how short of a time or how long of a time it is, um, I have to focus on what ingredients I'm adding, and I, you have to really be present. So you, it can kind of pull you away from everything else maddening that's going on in the world right now. And um, really, I think baking is a great stress reliever. Yeah, I do too. I think it's healthy. Um, one of the things in my book is it's not intended really as a book to um, receive it on delivery, then just open up straight to a recipe and start baking, um, because the book is entirely about method and technique. Um, and then it tells you what the recipes are to execute that. Uh, but if you'd actually take the time to read the book, read the introductory chapters, uh, hopefully it's not too painful. Um, and in the process, you, once you've done it for a few times, you've, you've learned a new skill that you're going to remember and you'll have this new skill for the rest of your life. And it's not hard. Uh, it just has a handful of specific things to, you know, like measure the water temperature before you um, introduce water into your dough mix. Uh, use your hands, don't use the stand mixer, and then you get a feel for the dough. And then uh, two or three times of doing it, you'll understand when you're mixing if the dough's right. Do you think this will this time will give us a resurgence and and basic life skills like cooking and bread making and things like that? Because a lot of people um, are learning on the fly right now. Yeah, <laughs> I hope they're doing well with it. Um, will it be a resurgence? Who knows? You know how things will be, but. I think, I think some, yeah, there's likely to be a number of people who find out they like doing it and they've gone through the learning process now. Um, and that takes more time. Uh, once you've learned it, you don't really have to make, take much effort to make the bread. You might just look at the recipe to consult. You forgot how much salt goes in the dough, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of, you know, it takes a lot of time to make good bread, but it's a lot of elapsed time. The amount of active time is really, it's very small. The same with uh, making pizza dough at home. Um, time is a critical ingredient. You can't make a great pizza in a short period of time, but the amount of active time um, is very little and you just need to maybe plan a day ahead. And speaking of ingredients, um, there are four ingredients that go into all of your breads and um, you take those, um, those are come from the title of your book. There's flour, water, salt, and yeast, um, which are things you're likely to already have on hand in your pantry. Um, is it really that simple <laughs> hopefully um sometimes right now you know i understand that it's difficult to find flour at the store or some stores have flour but no yeast um so you know work with what you got yeah i was actually going to ask you about that because i was at the store last night and the first thing that i couldn't find was toilet paper that's back but now all the yeast is gone but um from research that i've done basically According to what I've read, and I wanted to ask you, since you're the expert, um, you can take baking soda and add an acid to create a yeast at home, like a lemon. No, um, or... there's you can get leavening that way, but there's there's essentially two kinds of leavening. There's chemical leavening, which is baking soda, baking powder, and what you're talking about is kind of creating that. Um, uh, and then the, that's chemi called chemical leavening, and that's used to make biscuits, pancakes, um, kinds of shortbreads. Um, but yeasted leavening uh, requires yeast. Okay, and so you, no, you, no work around. It's a completely different, no work around unless you want to make your own sourdough culture at home. Uh, so 
I've been getting a lot of questions about that this past week of, uh, okay, I can't buy yeast. I'm going to do it. I'll make sourdough culture. Um, and then they're telling me, but your book requires a lot of flour to make it. And I'm like, yeah, but it works. Uh, and then on the other hand, you could use less flour. <laughs> I, um, I went with a lot of flour, in, especially in my first book, Flour, Water, Salt, Yeast. I have used about almost a pound of water, flour a day. And it's, you don't need that much. Um, at the time, it made sense to me. In both of my books, in the, in the ingredients chapters, um, I recommend this. Um, it's a one pound package of LSAF yeast. And you can store it in the refrigerator or in the freezer and it will last you over a year. Oh, wow. um, and the value of that is once you have it, you're set. You don't need to you know, worry about what are you going to use the next time you want to bake bread. Um, and it will hold for a long time and it's available online. So I found it on Amazon. Um, I think you can find it in like a local, um, uh, there's some local stores in the Portland area that sell to restaurants that have basically kitchenware items, whatever. Um, it's out there if you want to order it. So get one of these and you're set for a long time. That's a great tip to know because that's what I was doing yesterday. I was fishing for those little bitty packets. Yeah, this is <laughs> <things are> bullshit. <laughs> um, so... A new book that I was just reading is um, Dominic Ansel's new book, and he talks about um, how some people have a fear of baking, um, but I think specifically some people have a fear of um, bread making sometimes because um, it seems like a daunting task since you're so used to just you know buying a loaf at the store. So what would you say to people who might be a little timid about doing it? Um, what do you need to know to, to do it for your first time? Uh, well, it, it, it sounds self-serving, but... Um, if you have good instructions, you can make good bread and it's not very hard. Um, there's a few equipment items you might want to have at home. Um, my methods use a Dutch oven for baking, uh, which is pretty critical. Um, and the same with like Jim Leahy's book, uh, My Bread, um, and the Tartine books. But um, I mean, that, that's the most important thing is having good instruction uh, and believing, that, believing in yourself, you know? I like that. But um, speaking of, you said Dutch oven, I was going to ask you about what tools you need. Um, interestingly, um, I was reading 650% increase in at-home bread makers and they're selling out, but you don't, you don't need one of those machines, right, um, to do it yourself at home. Uh, I really don't like the bread making machines. They're good for some people. Um, uh, they make fast, fast rising breads with a lot of yeast. Um, it's not the kind of bread I want to eat. Um, if people like it, that's fine. I'm, I'm not judgmental about it. Uh, but this, my techniques are not bread machine. They're, the, the idea of the breads in my book are to give you bread that's of the quality of uh, a really good craft bakery that you make yourself at home. One thing about bread making is you don't need a lot of tools. Um, we do want the Dutch oven, but in a scale, correct. Um, but other than that, we're, we're mixing by hand. We don't mixing by hand, you know, I recommend uh, a, you, you need a pretty good sized container to mix it and make it easy. Mm -hmm. uh, if you use a container that's too small, you just find your, you know, you work, your hand's working in a space that's not big enough for, uh, especially for, for what you need to do with it. Uh, so I recommend um, uh, a 12 quart dough tub with a lid. Um, they're not very expensive. I also like to have a, a digital probe thermometer. Uh, so when I ask you to use water at 85 or 90 degrees, you can get pretty close to that. Um, yeah, uh, but it doesn't, no, it doesn't take much. Uh, the wicker baskets are great if you can get one for proofing your bread, but if you don't have one, you can, you know, use uh, like a big salad bowl. Um, there's other options out there. And speaking to that, um, can you talk about how both time and temperature impact what you're doing when you're making bread in the kitchen? Yeah, I, I it was so important to make sure people get it. Uh, that instead of just including that information in the body of text in the book, I called it out as, as an essential ingredient in doing these breads well. Uh, time is a critical ingredient. You, can't, you need a lot of it. <laughs> you can't bake good bread in a short amount of time um, and, or a small amount of time, if you're thinking ingredient-wise. Uh, and temperature the same way. And there's sort of this balance where um, uh, the warmer temperatures in bread doughs um, increases I don't mean to sound technical, but increases the metabolic rate of the flora that's in the dough. That means the yeast will reproduce faster. And if you can control the temperature of your dough, which I ask you to do, it's not hard, just follow my instructions, then you can have a reliable timeline for getting the right results. 
So if I ask you to have a dough that takes five hours to ferment, um, those five hours are only going to work if the dough is at the right temperature. If the dough is too cold, then you're not going to get as much development in that five hour period. Likewise, if let's say you live in the South, you know, let's say you live in Charleston, um, where it's warm and humid, things are going to happen faster. I'm from Alabama, so. <laughs> yes, you get it. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, these are critical ingredients, and I tried to put enough information about that so you know how to manage it. You encourage um, a really brown crust on the bread when it comes out. That's what we're looking yeah. for. Yeah. Um, you had said that um, even when you had first started your bakery, there was a few complaints here and there about the color of the brown. Um, why, do, why do we really want that brown crust? Um, I want it for both flavor and texture. And I don't want a thick crust either. Um, for me, the ideal crust um, on these kind of rustic Levant breads is going to be that it's got, um, it's, it's got that kind of color to it, but it's not thick and overly chewy. Uh, I really want it to be crisp but pliable, if that makes any sense. Um, same in a baguette. I want a thin, crisp crust that crackles when you cut into it or squish it, uh, but we don't need that dark color in a baguette to get there. In the Levant breads, uh, I go for this almost mahogany color in the crust because first off, it looks cool. <laughs> um, secondly, it, to me, it tastes better. And then the flavor of that dark crust, it'll permeate into the dough itself. It'll permeate into the crumb. So the interior of the bread will have a more interesting flavor if you bake the entire loaf completely. And even now, um, I get pictures on, you know, somebody sends me an Instagram, hey, look what I did, cool. And I'm, you know, my first thing is, uh, read page 38, <laughs> bake it till it's dark or whatever page number it is, you know? Um, so there's a lot of tendency for a lot of people and depending on where you live, like where you grew up in Alabama, you, you, you the color of your breads there were very blonde, I'm sure. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and when I started baking in Portland in 2001, um, it was the same. It was very unusual. People didn't, a lot of people didn't like it. We were not immediately successful either. Now I see that all over the place. It's a pretty commonly accepted um, color for baking, you know, kind of rustic Levant breads like we do. Uh, but that's more currently accepted than it was 19 years ago for, by far. Um, so speak, you said baguettes. Um, I was talking to a coworker earlier who was saying um, one of the things he misses right now the most um, about having his local bakery closed is um, those baguettes. And he's tried to make some baguettes at home, but they tend to turn out dry. Um, I see you shaking. Uh, <laughs> making, making baguettes in the home oven is a real challenge. I'm not good at it. Uh, I intentionally did not put baguette recipes in my books because um, I didn't want to. You know, I, the, baguette's the kind of bread that you should hopefully have a good bakery close by. Um, the reason I do the Dutch oven baking for, the, for all the breads in flour, water, salt, yeast um, is steam is also a necessary component of baking these kinds of bread, um, and these sort of hearth breads. If it's a pan bread, not that big a deal. But if you're making hearth breads, you need a, a lot of steam in the oven. But home ovens are actually designed to vent the steam. So even if you come up with a clever way of putting steam in the oven, it's not going to stay in the oven long enough to coat the bread. You get it. So you know, when you put it inside a Dutch oven, uh, and plus my breads are, they have a lot of water in them, in their dough. They're, they're kind of wet, sticky doughs. I'm not the only one to do this, by the way. And they essentially will steam themselves. I remember as a child watching I Love Lucy, I don't know if you've ever seen that episode where they make the big bread that just keeps coming out of the oven, but I feel like we're, there's a lot of emphasis given on kneading and you have to knead and knead and knead the bread, but you um, warn against, caution against that. Um, you say we don't need to overwork the dough. Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, Jim Leahy uh, gets, from New York, gets a lot of the credit for that. His no knead bread um, was a model for that. Uh, the other bakers, including myself, um, adapted for our books. And Jim didn't invent that. Um, in France, it would have been called pain de grand-mère, <laughs> grandma's bread. So, I mean, that technique's been around for a while, but it was not in the public consciousness at all. And um, anyway, that's, that was the reason for, uh, I forget, I actually forget your question. I just want to give credit where credit's due. You know what I mean? Um, so why don't we want to over the bread? Oh, <laughs> that took a hard left turn, didn't I? Um, because it's not necessary. Um, you know, in, in, in my technique, I have you 
mix the bread dough with your hands. I use a, I call it a pincer method, which I learned from Michelle Suas at the San Francisco Baking Institute. Um, again, credit where it's due, right? Um, but it doesn't really need um, that kind of kneading that people think bread dough needs. Um, what I do do, however, though, is one of the things that happens in kneading in a mechanical mixer like we use at my bakery is um, it does develop the gluten. Um, the gluten will develop naturally in the ferment, but uh, I need the dough to have a little bit more strength because my doughs are really slack. Uh, so I introduced this process of putting folds into the dough where four or five times during the bulk evolution of the, the bulk ferment, the first stage, um, you just go to your dough tub and you just stretch and fold and stretch and fold and stretch and fold. Uh, and you do that a few times during this bulk ferment and that gives more strength to the dough. Uh, and then at the, the, one of the results is you'll get more volume in your loaf. You'll get a lighter crumb when you do that. Okay. So um, one personal story I wanted to ask you about too, um, and forgive me because my French accent is terrible, but uh, Jacques Pavan's <laughs> daughter um, worked with you um, at the bakery. Um, and Loving. And to um, a bistro. So could you tell us a little bit about working with Claudine? Um, Claudine's just amazing, lovely human being. Um, I really enjoyed having her at my bakery. And this was in 2003. Uh, but Claudine and her husband, Raleigh Wieson, worked there. Um, and the backstory to that is um, I opened my bakery at the end of 2001. Uh, we were not doing well, and I kind of feared going under. And I looked at my space, and you know, we closed every day at 6 o'clock. And I thought, well, what if I found a way to turn this into a restaurant in the evenings, give me another source of income? And at that point in time, I'd recently met Claudine and Raleigh. They had just moved to Portland, um, and neither one was working at that point in time. And, you know, we started kicking around ideas. And the, the result was we turned my bakery, the cafe area, because we could seat 30 people. Uh, we turned the cafe into uh, uh, a five-night-a-week minimal menu bistro. We'd have one plat du jour. So, you know, maybe this week is Coco Van, you know. Um, uh, and then we'd have a handful of rustic pastries, a salad, um, and some desserts. It was, it was a very minimal menu. Uh, fortunately, people did come. Uh, Claudine ran the front, Raleigh ran the kitchen, uh, and they were actually only in there for a few months. Uh, they got married a couple months into it, um, and then I, I couldn't afford to pay them much. Um, and so um, uh, it wasn't long, and I was happy for them. They were both able to get real jobs that paid legitimate salaries. Um, but the very cool thing is while Claudine was working there, her father uh, visited and uh, came in and I got to have dinner with uh, Claudine and Jacques Pepin at my bakery. Uh, and it was one of those memories that, you know, it will be with me for the rest of my life. And, and uh, I, really, really awesome. And I read that he said that your um, croissant was one of the best that he's ever tasted. So I was curious about that. Um, do you have any tips for um, people trying to make croissants at home right now, also with their bakeries closed? Um, making croissants at home is really difficult. Um, it is doable. It's not something I'm interested in doing because I want a sheeter, you know, which, is, which laminates the dough. Um, and I don't want to work it with a rolling pin. Um, I just have no interest in doing it. Um, but a number of people say, do a pastry book, do a croissant book. Um, I probably wasn't supposed to write the Jacques, the Jacques said that, by the way, um, uh, because he, he very intentionally does not do endorsements, and I don't blame him. Um, and I felt just a little bit guilty for doing that. Um, you know how a lot of chef cookbooks or memoirs will talk about their early days, their difficult times, and then when very early on someone that was very meaningful to them said something really complimentary and just gave them that confidence that – you know, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. This will work out. Um, and when Jacques told me that, it just filled me with so much joy and pride and confidence um, that it meant a lot to me. And I, I, I wanted to include that in my personal story because of how relevant it was. And I felt in that era, uh, I don't feel that now, but in that era, I felt like I was doing really great work and not really getting any public attention for it. Um, because we all kind of want our ego stroked a little bit, right? And right. then I just needed, I needed customers. <laughs> um, so I wrote it, and, and when I wrote the book, I didn't need the customers. I didn't need that public attention, but I was putting the mindset that I had in the year 2003 when I was still losing money and struggling, working 100-hour weeks, 
of what it felt like. And I was trying to translate that experience. And um, I'm probably not a good enough writer to get that point across. I've always felt a little bit guilty for making that mention because I you know, was specifically told that you know, Jacques didn't do any public endorsements, but I did it anyway, for good or for ill. As a, as a reader, um, I found it very meaningful. Um, so one, one thing I wanted to say is um, all of your recipes um, make two batches essentially. So you can save an extra to make focaccia yeah. or pizza, um, which gives me the segue into your um, second book, um, yeah. Elements of Pizza, yeah. um, which is all about pizza. But I just got back from Italy and um, it was my first time and I just never tasted pizza like that before. And you talk about your trip. Um, very different, isn't it? Yes. But you talk about your trip of going to Naples and how it changed how you thought about pizza. So I was curious yeah. to hear more about that. It did. I mean, it all came, it was a mano a mano lecture from a man who I greatly admire, Enzo Cotia, uh, from Pizzeria La Notizia in Naples. Um, and so was, um, he's a man, he's, he's got a big warm heart and he's in really intimidating <laughs> until you get to know him, right? Um, but, you know, I had approached pizza as another kind of bread, um, even at Ken's Artisan Pizza, which at the point I went to Naples, you know, we've been open for eight years and we're known nationwide. We always ended up on like top 100 lists. And, uh, but the trip to Italy definitely changed my point of view. And it was great. And what Enzo, you know, he was like, you know, he wouldn't know who I was, so he knew how to speak with me. And uh, he said, so pizza's not the same as bread. You know, like he's talking to a child. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, but I did want to ask you, um, we always have a war, you know, especially me being from New York of who has the best pizza and whether it's Neapolitan style, New York style, deep dish style um, for folks in Chicago and places like that. Do you have a personal favorite type of pizza? Uh, well, let's first talk pizza towns. Um, in the U.S., New York, hands down, was, is, and always shall be number one pizza city in the country. Um, there's just no doubt about it. First off, pizza in the U.S. started in New York City um, and northern New Jersey. Um, and uh, the history there goes back to basically Neapolitans and southern Italians who fled Italy in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, numbers are like five, six million. I mean, that's especially in that period of time. I don't know what the pop of the U.S. was, uh, but if you add another five to ten percent of the population of the U.S., that was the Italian immigration in that era, which is huge, right? And they were fleeing famine, um, so it was a survival thing for them. But they brought their food culture with them, um, and the and pizza was a big part of that. And then the pizza that they made was not exactly the pizza that they made in Naples because the pizza in Naples was either fried, it was dough that went into a fryer and was then topped, um, or it was well, calzone, um, the dough would be filled and then in the fryer, uh, or it was baked in wood-fired ovens. And in the U.S., the ovens they had available were bread ovens that were coal-fired, uh, and they used those to make pizza. And then the American ingredients were probably American canned tomatoes or American fresh tomatoes. Um, it's unsure when canning of tomatoes started in Italy. It might not have been until the 1920s, but the first pizzeria was Lombardi's, which was opened in uh, it was 1904, I think, or 1906. I wish Scott Wiener was here to correct me. Yeah. Um, anyway, you know, you're talking about different pizza styles and yeah, and it, to me, it always goes back in the U.S. to New York because that's where pizza began. And it's been part of uh, the New York culture. But, you know, remember that even through the 1950s, uh, pizza was an ethnic food. Um, there were dollar, well, I mean, then maybe it would have, the equivalent would have been 25 cent or dime. But there weren't dollar slice joints or their equivalents in New York until, what, the 70s? Um, and so um, it was really an ethnic food up until about you know, 50, 60 years ago, at which you know, point it really started to blossom out there. Anyway, New York's full of great pizzerias and it has such great pizza culture. It'll always be number one for me. You make a point of saying is that um, really once you get the basics of pizza making down, that um, you can make a pizza just as good as any takeout at home. Um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll qualify that a little bit. Um, when I was working on the elements of pizza, which as a writer, I think was, uh, uh, was a better book than flour, water, salt, yeast. Of course, you know, I'm criticizing myself here. Um, but I was, I really loved that book. Um, I loved working on it. Everything about it just really fell into place. Um, what I found, what I was really excited about when I just started making pizzas at home for the book was how good they were. And uh, I thought that they were definitely uh, better than any chain store pizza that you would ever get delivered to home. Um, it's also my personal taste, you know. Um, if you've got a really good pizzeria in the neighborhood with a commercial pizza oven, you don't have it. I mean, it, they're going to make a better pizza than you can. But what was really thrilling was how good you can make pizza at home. And especially now that there's rock boxes out there and there's other home pizza making equipment that will, you might see the wood fired oven right behind me. <laughs> so, um, you know, you have options now, but I had to write the book for, you know, what can you do with a 500 degree or 550 degree oven at home? And I was really happy with what I was able to do. Um, if you use a good dough, and use good ingredients and good technique, um, you can get there. Do you have a favorite flavor combination? You know, I grew up eating cheese pizza. Yeah. Um, uh, and so that's always my favorite pizza. It's just tomato sauce and cheese. <laughs> so um, in closing, I just wanted to ask you, I think both bread and pizza um, are two things that bring people together. You can break bread together as the saying goes. Absolutely. So I was just wondering if, that's one of the reasons why you bake. Why do you bake? You know, there's a, a lot of reasons. Um, one is I wanted a craft. I wanted to make something with my own hands to transform in something into something else um, that was cool. <laughs> um, and I wanted uh, the thing about bread baking that really appealed to me, and that was my first thing was to be a bread baker, uh, was its connection to history. and you know, uh, bread baking goes back, we don't really know how long, 6,000 years, I thought, when I was writing my first book. Uh, now there's evidence from archaeological digs that show evidence of baking that go back 10,000 years. Uh, it's a fundamental part of Western food culture. And uh, I wanted to be part of that. 